Welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. Today we're going to talk about objections to water baptism. Is it necessary to be saved or is it not? Stay tuned. All right, so we're back. So in the last episode, we talked about what the New Testament says about how somebody becomes a Christian. And for a lot of you watching, we may have said something that you're like, whoa, wait a minute. Those guys believe that. (laughs) And what we said is that you have to hear the gospel. You have to believe it. You have to repent of your sins. You have to confess Christ. And then we believe you have to be baptized in water to be saved. And so we know from a lot of you watching uh, already from some of the comments in some of the previous episodes, they've said, well, wait a minute, you guys believe that? And so in this episode, we're going to talk about that. And we want to say this right off the bat. If you disagree with us, just hang tight. We know that for a lot of you, this is a really controversial thing that we're saying. And so we want to go through and show you that we're not just believing this for any, some random reason. We've studied the Bible for years, specifically this topic. I've studied this topic in depth in English and in Greek for like 10 years because I don't want to be wrong about this one. And so today we're going to talk about objections to the idea that you have to be baptized in water. So just hang tight with us. Um, Be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. It says that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they searched the scriptures daily and basically tested, now I'm paraphrasing, this isn't quoting it, but they tested what the apostle Paul taught them. So the apostle Paul is teaching them and they're like, all right, let's check this with scripture. That's what we want you to do because obviously we're not apostles. We're not inspired. But Yeah, definitely not. (laughs) But we want you to open up your Bibles, listen to this. And if you have any questions, please contact us. I know all three of us are happy to talk to you. And if you say, well, you know what? Like I bet my pastor could, could answer their questions. We'd be happy to talk to your pastor. I mean, send us a message, send us a message. We will call on the phone with you, your pastor, whoever you want there. And we can talk about this and have an open dialogue and try to basically iron sharpen iron and see what the scripture says. So, um, so that was a long intro, but thanks for watching. (laughs) So guys, let's talk about some objections to baptism. So um, maybe we'll do it a little bit different. On this episode, I want to try to quiz you guys the way I've been quizzed over the years. Oh okay. Boy. So, okay, you tell me I have to be baptized in water to be saved. Um, and obviously we all believe that the blood of Christ is what washes away our sins. Revelation 1.5, the blood of Christ has loosed us, washed us, depending on your translation, from our sins. So let's say you, Tucker says, Aaron, you have to be baptized to contact the blood of Christ. And I say, well, Tucker, what about the thief on the cross? Yeah. I'd say that's a really good one. Um, it's brought, it's been brought up a lot my entire life. So yeah, the first one I'd say the thief on the cross, I would jump to Hebrews nine, 16 through 17. It talks about the rules for a will and Jesus's will that was going to take place. But if you know anything about a will, it can't take place until someone dies. Mm-hmm. And so, um, if you'll jump over that Hebrews nine, yeah, 16 through 17, great passage, um, yeah. One thing to point out about the thief on the cross, just some quick points I'd say is once Jesus died, everything went into place. Mm-hmm. Um, when he was brought back from the dead, when he rose and defeated death, mm-hmm. you know, he defeated death. Mm-hmm. That is when everything took into place. So people say, well, the thief on the cross, it's like, well, Jesus was still living under the old Testament. And yeah. so it didn't apply then. Yeah. You know, you can't say, well, I could be, I can be saved just like the thief on the cross when Jesus hadn't even died and been buried and rose back from the dead. You know, that's so. right. Like, you know, Romans 10, nine and 10 talks about, you have to believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Well, that hadn't even happened yet. And if you, so you, the story of the thief on the cross is in Luke chapter 23, right? So Tucker made a great point. He said, Hebrews nine seventeen. it says basically that a Testament comes into a fact Uh, into a place after the death of the testator. Jesus is the testator. So Jesus was still alive, right? When did it come into effect though? Look at this. Look at Luke 23. Luke 23, 43. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, assuredly, I say to you today, you'll be with me where? In paradise. paradise, The thief on the cross was saved. Okay. Jesus saved the thief on the cross. He had the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Luke 23, Jesus dies. He's buried. Luke 24, he's risen. This is after the resurrection. Look at Luke 24, 47. Luke 24, 47, after his death, burial, resurrection, he says what? In Luke 24, 47, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning where? At Jerusalem. At Jerusalem. So wait a minute. The thief on the cross has died, been buried. Jesus has died, buried, been resurrected. Jesus still says the new covenant hasn't come into force yet. It's going to go when beginning in Jerusalem. Yeah. When does that happen? What acts chapter, what is it? Acts chapter two. Yeah. Acts chapter two. You're right. right. So 
basically the new covenant, which is Christianity, what we live under, that started in Acts chapter two. So the thief on the cross died under a different covenant. It would be like if I said, Tucker, well, um, Abraham wasn't baptized. You'd be like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're right. He was never required to be baptized in Jesus' name. Jesus didn't give the command, he that believes and is baptized will be saved until after his death, burial, resurrection. So it's really like, it's a little bit bigger of a picture. But if I said, well, Abraham wasn't baptized, you'd say, well, yeah, because he didn't need to be. You know? That's right. Same thing with the thief on the cross. Yeah. yeah, but that's one that people point to a lot. And I know why. I hear preachers all the time say, you don't have to be baptized because the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. And I'm like, man, you're missing a humongous point about when did Christianity start? Yeah, it's just to continue that illustration of what the Hebrews writer gives, that there must be the necessity of the death of the testator Mm -hmm. from where the testament Mm -hmm. is. Acts chapter 2 is where you see that being executed, Mm -hmm. that will is being set forth. Just like in a lot of ways we have them today. You write a will, Mm -hmm. you die. The lawyer comes in, they gather the people around that the will is addressing, and then they execute, they carry forth that will. In Acts chapter 2, we see the beginning of that happening, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it it applies to the people that the will was addressed to. Abraham, it was not addressed to him, so it doesn't apply to him. Yeah, that's, well, you're, so the thief on the cross, he was never given the command by Jesus to believe, to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus to basically reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because it hadn't happened yet. The, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it and happened. Someone to say like, well, we could be saved just like him. Well, if you were going to be saved exactly like him, you'd have to be on the cross right next to Jesus and for Jesus to say that. But yeah, this is one of the most controversial topics that I've ever heard growing yeah. up. But the two points I would just say is if you're listening, if you're watching, like the two things I'll keep in mind, like what does the Bible say? Number one. Mm-hmm. And then number two, it's all about Jesus. Like this isn't about some holy water. Mm-hmm. It's all about Christ. Yeah. I mean, the thief on the cross lived during the time of the law of Moses. He, does, he did not live under the Christian age, which a lot of people forget that. They think, oh, well, you know, when Jesus was living, Jesus, Matthew 5, 17, lived while the law of Moses was still in effect, and he nailed it to the cross, Colossians 2, 14 through 18, and Ephesians mm-hmm. 2. So if you look at Jesus, he'd heal a man and say, go offer this, the, uh, the offering to the priest that the law requires. They still lived under the law of Moses. Jesus nailed that to the cross. So That's we right. live under a different law. It's like uh, Romans 6, 3. Throw this out here real quick. Romans yeah. 6, 3 through 4 teaches that when we're baptized, we're doing what? Into his death. Yeah. So we're reenacting his death, burial, and mm-hmm. resurrection. We can't do that as in the Christian age until after he's died. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the only time. Uh, the thief couldn't do that. Yeah. In Romans 10, 9, and 10, you have to believe and confess that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he raised from the dead. Right. Well, the thief on the cross didn't even know that was going to happen yet. You know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Jesus even told his disciples in, in the Gospel of Mark, I think in chapter 8, 31, 9, 31, and 10, 30, I don't know, 33 and 34. He said he was going to die, be buried and resurrect. And even the disciples were like, what does he mean resurrect from the dead? It's like they already knew he raised Jairus's daughter before. They knew what raising from the dead was, but they're like, the Messiah can't die. The Messiah is not going to die. So the thief on the cross, I, I would assume, did not know about it. If Jesus told his disciples and they're like, what does he mean? By that? You know? So, okay. Now we talked about Acts chapter two. Let's go there because this is another really big uh, objection. So. Acts chapter 2 is the day that the Christian covenant, the gospel, the good news of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and the church is established. It's the first day that's preached. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches to the people there, the Jewish people on the day of Pentecost, and he preaches them about, look, basically summarize, you can read Acts chapter 2. You killed the Messiah that God sent, and God resurrected him. He's been exalted the right hand of God, and the people are pricked in the heart. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So they ask the apostle, they are already believers, right? This idea of, is it just belief? They already believe. They ask Peter what to do. And Peter says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. This is the key here. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're not going to go into what the gift of the Holy Spirit is now, because that's we could talk for an hour and a half or two hours about that. Another episode. Another episode. Mm-hmm. But we're going to talk about, he said, what do we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, Scott, what if I said to you, because this is an objection we hear all the time. Uh, well, Scott, I know you told me that means for the remission of my sins or forgiveness, but that word for actually means because of. So Peter is saying, repent and be baptized because your sins are already forgiven. How would you respond to that? 
Well, if the Bible were written in English, you might have an argument. Yeah. The word for can mean because of in English. That's mm-hmm. the way we use it. Uh, however, the text itself is, is written in Greek, and it uses the word ace or ice, depending on how you want to yeah. pronounce that, right? But it always means uh, it's looking forward. In other words, it's always unto or toward. In mm-hmm. other words, repent and be, da- be baptized so that you can obtain, mm-hmm. so that you will gain, mm-hmm. so that you will have after this is done. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, it, it's just a grammatical fact. Uh, what is it? We were talking sometime earlier, you mentioned uh, in your study, 1,700 times. 1,750 used. times. In the and New I had to write a master's class way. paper on this. So you're right. like, how does he know? Get I wrote paper. a, yeah, if, yeah. You want to, if you want to read a nerdy paper on what this Greek word means, uh, it's 30 pages long. <laughs> and um, that's pretty long. Yeah. So the Greek word ace, um, always points forward. Okay. So in, in, like Scott said, he made the perfect point. If you argue from English, this can be confusing. For instance, if I said, well, Scott, um, uh, this man was sent to prison for murder. You would say, well, did he go to murder? Did he go to prison in order to obtain murder? You say, no, he went to prison because (laughs) he murdered. Well, that sounds good in English, but the new Testament was not written in English. It was written in Greek and in Greek, the word ace means in order to, it's looking forward 1750 times, right? There's a different Greek word that would have been used. This is in what's called the accusative case. It would have been the Greek word dia, D-I-A. Luke, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew Greek, okay? It's the language. He, he, he knew Greek. If he wanted to say because of, he would have used dia in the accusative case. So that argument, yeah, if you want that paper, if you want to read 30 pages, I go through the history of the argument all the way back in the 1920s. There was this one guy named J.R. Manti who basically said, I'm trying not to launch off into this nerdy <laughs> dissertation on it. Yeah, that's okay. He basically said, well, there are some cases where it can mean because of. And Ralph Marcus, who was a just monster Greek scholar, basically said, no, you're wrong on all those. Um, and so that was in the Journal of Biblical Literature in the 50s. So the fact of the matter is Matthew 26, 28. Do you have it pulled up? That. Okay, read yeah. that if you have it. Uh, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. So what what's the point? Yeah. Uh, if, if this word, if you want to see how this word ace is used, mm-hmm. you can look at this passage. He's not saying that he's shedding his blood because your sins have been forgiven. Yeah. He's saying, I'm going to shed it so that your sins can be forgiven. And that's the exact same Greek phrase. It's uh, ace, aphesin, harmartion. Those yeah. are three Greek words. So Acts 2.38, uh, uh, ace, aphesin, harmartion, Matthew 26, 28, shed his blood for, the, did Jesus shed his blood because sins were already forgiven? No. That doesn't make any sense. No, he shed his blood in order to obtain the remission of sins, which is exactly what Acts 2.38 uh, is saying. So, yeah, okay, I've probably spent too much time on that one. And before I launch off into anything else, there's one last thing. There's a guy named A.T. Robertson, who's a Greek scholar. And it's really interesting what he wrote. He did not believe you had to be baptized to be saved. But in uh, some of his different writings, I talk about this in my 30-page paper. Um, <laughs> it's a good point. But he basically said, sometimes your theology has to trump like what the text says. I was, I was blown away when I read that. This is a guy who's a Greek scholar who literally his job is, what does the text say? And he gets to this verse and he says, well, my theology doesn't line up with that. So sometimes your theology is going to trump what the Bible actually said. I was like, are you serious, man? What happened to, if the Bible says it, I'm going to believe it. You know, that's a pretty scary path to go down when you start being able to, you're the one to be able to choose what you want and what you don't want in the Bible. I mean, and think back to the garden of Eden, right? Yeah. Genesis chapter three, what does the devil God says, if you eat of this, you'll surely die. What's the devil say? No way. No, you won't die. That's not what, that's not what God meant. I'm telling you, that's the most dangerous thing you can go down a path. It's interesting that a man that's a, would, I guess would consider himself a Protestant would say that Mm -hmm. because that's pretty much what the Protestant movement was about breaking away from. Right. Yeah. It was the idea that, uh, well, the Bible says this, but church tradition teaches the church says mm-hmm. that's the same thing. Yeah. I mean, this is exactly the same thing. That is so, Luther anyway. basically said, that's not what the Bible says, you know, and there's still a lot of things I disagree with Luther on, but sure. His, the reason he left the Catholic church, he posted his 95 theses is he says, Hey, look, this, this is not what the Bible says, you know, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, look, what does the Bible say? Let's go back to it. Okay. So we're like halfway through the episode. Let's keep moving. Um, okay. Stuff. So what if I were to say, look, um, Ephesians two eight nine says we're saved by grace, which we are through faith, which we are not of works, lest any man should boast. And then I said, and pay attention to the second part, baptism is a work. Therefore, if it's by grace through faith, you, it can't include baptism. Now 
a lot of people do this and I don't know, I'm assuming you guys caught what I just did, Hmm. but there's something I did in there that's really sort of tricky that if you're not paying attention, you'll catch it. Number one, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says we're saved by grace. Are we saved by grace? Absolutely. Sure enough. Titus 2, 11 says the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation to all men, right? God's grace came in verse Mm -hmm. 12 of Titus 2 says instructing us. Say by grace through faith, okay? The faith, the yep. gospel, not of works. Now then I say, well, baptism's a work, okay? Work of who? How, how would you respond? I'm trying yeah, to make an assertion, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, well, you need to understand the point of the letter, right? We talked about context in an early ep- earlier episode. You need yeah. to understand why something's being written, to who it's being written to, and, and really what's being said around that passage, right? Yeah. And you need to compare that to what other passages say in the Bible that seemingly contradict that passage mm-hmm. so not of works okay well what about uh what about john six twenty nine? yeah jesus answered and said unto them this is the work of god that you believe on him whom he hath sent god is commanding certain works mm-hmm. the one here in this verse is he's commanding belief yep. and belief is a work yeah According you, to the Bible, belief yeah. is a work. So what kind of work are we talking about in Ephesians? Well, and you know, it's funny. In John 6, they ask Jesus, what are the works that we should be doing, basically? And Jesus yeah. says, believe. And sometimes people will say, oh, no, no, that says the work of God is belief, right? Listen to this. This is 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. There you go. Okay? That's, now, yeah. look at this is 2 Thessalonians 1, 1, 11. It's the end of the verse. I'm not going to read the whole verse. Fulfill all good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith. You may never have heard those verses, but the Bible says faith or belief is a work. Okay. Now the key, let's bring this back. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works. What kind of works are being talked about in Ephesians? Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, not, it's not just any work because belief is mm-hmm. called a work at least three times. I could show you more, but I'll stop there. So belief is called a work. Yeah. Ephesians 2 is not talking about obedience right? No. It's talking about you can't earn salvation. Right. I could never do enough good things to say like, man, God's got to let me in because look how good I am. I can't build enough hospitals. I can't make him make so many statues that honor God. I, mm-hmm. I can't, you know, I can't do anything that's extravagant or fancy that's going to say, mm-hmm. God, you owe this to me now. Mm-hmm. The only thing I can do is look at what God has told me to do, look at the work that he's given me to do and say, yes, sir, I'll do mm-hmm. that. Basically say, I submit to you. Yeah. That's the kind of work that saves you. Yeah. Not the, not the, not the building of things, not yeah. the charity, how much money you give. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes people also, let me read you another passage. Well, okay. Before we leave Ephesians, let me, let me look at this. Ephesians chapter two, who wrote it through the, insp- God wrote it through the inspiration of the Holy spirit, but who was the penman? The apostle who? Say it again. Who, sorry. I'm talking <laughs> the, apo- who wrote the, uh, uh, a, a Ephesian letter. Oh, it's Paul. Okay. Yeah. Apostle Paul. Yeah. So the apostle Paul writes the Ephesian letter. Listen to what he says in verse four. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which, which, with which he loved us. So Paul says, God loved me and the Ephesians. Okay. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then it goes into by grace, you've been saved. So Paul says, I was saved by grace through faith, not of works. But how was Paul saved? Yeah, that's a good point. Let's, mm-hmm. let's fl- go to Acts chapter 22 really quickly. Acts chapter 22 the Apostle Paul, if you want one, if you said, Aaron, give me the nail in the coffin, or if you're watching and you're like, I disagree with you, just study this passage on your own and try to disprove what we're saying. This is my favorite one right here. It, Acts twenty two sixteen. okay? Paul's conversion is told in Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. Acts 9 and 22 are the greater, the f- more full stories. In Acts chapter 9, you read that Paul meets Jesus, calls him Lord. That's not verse 6. Verse 9 he fasts uh, and doesn't drink for three days. Verse 11, he prays, okay, the whole time. So he's praying for three days. In Acts 22, it's told again. And in Acts 22, after meeting Jesus, calling him Lord, praying for likely three days, fasting, which shows his repentance. So he's done everything. He's believed, repented. He's confessed him as Lord. And Ananias comes to him in Acts 22, 16 and says what? says, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. What's the last part of the verse? Wash away your sins. After that. Oh. Calling on the name of the Lord. Oh, yeah. Call, call on so he says, Lord. arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Wait, what, a, what do you mean sins? I thought he was saved already. He was not saved on the road to Damascus. So arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Here's, here's where a lot of people think they see the sinner's prayer, right? What, what would you say if I told you, Scott, you don't have to be baptized. You just have to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Man, 
I would say let's look at these same passages you just mentioned. Yeah. I mean, who do you think was praying for three days? That's right. Who was down on their knees, right? Yeah. It was Paul. And and he was still told, ah, there's something you need to get up and do. Yeah. What do you need to get up and do? You need to get up, arise, right, mm-hmm. and be baptized and wash away your sins. And in doing that, you're what? Calling, calling on, on the, the name of the Lord. Calling right? on the name of the Lord is not a prayer. Yeah. If it was, you just said it. Paul had already been praying for three days. Yeah. If calling on the name of the Lord's a prayer, why wasn't Paul saved already? Yeah. And if you look, calling on the name of the Lord, remember we started in Acts 2.38. Acts 2.21, Peter says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a quote from like Joel 2.32. Mm-hmm. And then the people later in that same sermon say, what do we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. Right. Call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Hey, how do we do that? Repent and be baptized. Right. Call. I mean, it, it also brings my mind to something we talked about in an earlier episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing something in the name of Jesus, in the mm-hmm. name of the Lord, is doing it by his authority. Mm-hmm. Jesus has given certain authority for you to be saved. Mm-hmm. What authority is that? It's the one that the apostles taught That's in right. Acts chapter 2. It's the one that he taught in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Yeah. In other places, Paul is submitting to that authority. That's what he's doing. He's appealing to that authority that Christ has laid out, yeah. that you will be saved when yeah. you obey the gospel. He already believes. Yeah. He's already con- he's, he's definitely willing to confess. Yeah. I mean, hey, yeah. look, you see that in, in the account. Yeah. Uh, he's penitent. All that's left now. Yeah. Arise and be baptized. That's right. Wash away your sins. Submit to the authority that God has given. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network, or GBN for short. You can hop on the App Store, search Gospel Broadcasting Network, and you can download the app. And there's this show, many other great shows that you can watch or listen to. Start learning more about the Bible and uh, why we're here, what our purpose is. Thanks for listening. You know, I want to give a parallel from the Old Testament. Um, sometimes there's something called baptismal regeneration. And that's what this is. This is this idea that there's power in water, right? This is what the Catholic Church teaches, which we oppose, okay? Uh, Any Catholics watching, we love you. We would like to study with you individually more. But the Catholic Church teaches that there's power in water. They call it a sacrament. You put a baby in. Baby has no faith, can't even talk or believe yet. And it washes the sins away, according to the Catholic Church. That's baptismal regeneration. Unfortunately, there are even websites like a big popular one called gotquestions.org that says baptismal regeneration is the idea that when you are baptized in faith and trusting in God's word, that's not baptismal regeneration. I I don't know the right way to say that, but gotquestions.org just uses the definition wrong. So the story I want to go to in the Old Testament to show you a parallel of what we're teaching. Second Kings chapter five, we don't have time to cover it. Um, In second Kings five, there is a man named Naaman. He's from Syria. He's like a general. And he goes to Elisha because he has leprosy. And Elisha says, if you want to be cleansed of your leprosy, go to the Jordan River and dip seven times. Okay. Now he goes and he dips in the Jordan River seven times after some, you know, pushback at first. But he does it and his leprosy is healed. Now, if I was going to ask you, Tucker, what cleansed Naaman's leprosy? Was it the water or was it God? I know some people would probably say there must be some holy water, but it's Mm -hmm. God. He's the one that did He's the one that cleansed him. Yeah, because he, God says, you do this, and I will. this will be uh, the benefit that I give you. Mm-hmm. He says, you go wash in the river, I'll cleanse your leprosy. Now, Naaman dipped seven times, his leprosy is cleansed. Now, I bet you Naaman didn't come up out of the water and say, man, look how good I am. I earned this cleansing. No, he knows the power is in God. The God is the one that has the power, right? So that's what we're teaching about baptism. Now, if Naaman would have said like, you know what, Lord, I got so much faith in you. You can save me right here from my leprosy. I don't need to go dip in that river. What do you think would have happened? <laughs> I, I don't think. Been, yeah. yeah, it wouldn't have been healed. Not happen. Mm. That's Hebrews chapter 11. You mentioned that we were just sitting around here drinking coffee earlier. The whole point of Hebrews 11 is by faith, they did something. Yeah. Every time you read about one of those people, it talks about they were saved by faith and mm-hmm. it tells you what they did. Mm-hmm. Every one of them mm-hmm. saved what they did. Yeah. Faith. What they did. Yeah. What you just said about Naaman is great to me. Um, that example of him going and submitting, it's not what he did that saved him. Mm-hmm. It was his submission to God and mm-hmm. is a perfect parallel to what I think is being taught right there in First Peter 3, 21, right? Mm-hmm. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Not the fact that Naaman's going to go down in this water and wash his leprosy mm-hmm. off. That's not going to get rid of it. But that answer of a good conscience towards God, that submitting yourself to God's authority, mm-hmm. in this case, in 1 Peter 3, 21, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's how we have our sins washed away yep. by the blood of Christ that's when right. we submit to him. In Naaman's case, it was submitting to God. He washed away that leprosy. Yeah, It's a very good parallel. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Well, in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, in, bapti- in, in being baptized, you're calling on the name of the Lord. 
1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you. How? Not the removal of the filth of flesh, not a Saturday bath, but it's your appeal to God for a good right. conscience. It's you calling to his name, right. saying, Lord, I have faith in your word, which is what Colossians 2.11 and 12 says. Yep. I have faith in your word. Cleanse me from my sins. Even um, though there's water, it's not yeah, the water. No. It's the fact that you're doing what God said. That's he right. told you. Yeah. Go down on the water. That's right. One cool thing that you can do is, my wife and I did this, get a sheet of paper. Um, Bruce Hatcher, a preacher, told us to do this. Write down how you became a Christian on the left side, right side, write down everything New Testament Christians did. But one cool thing that my wife and I noticed is that there's a pattern. And every time when you go back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, it's when the church first started. Mm -hmm. um, every time you see someone obey the gospel or become a Christian, however you want to say it, um, it ends up people are coming out of the water. Yeah. I mean, so it's a pattern, like, why are all these people, yeah. if it's not part of the plan, you know, how come all these people are coming out wet of this water after yeah. wanting to become a Christian? Yeah, when you look, for instance, another objection, Acts 16, right? I see, I, I was on gotquestions.org this morning reading their article about baptism, just to make sure I accurately represented what they said. Yeah. And they said, you know why we know you don't have to be baptized? They said, John three sixteen says, only belief. For God so loved the world, whosoever believes in him. I'm like, well... What, what happened 11 verses earlier? <laughs> Jesus just said to Nicodemus, you must be born of water and the spirit. Yeah. I mean, nobody even argued that was baptism until John Calvin in the 1500s said, you know what? I don't think this is water baptism, even though he even admitted in his John commentary that everybody before him said it was water baptism. So Acts, okay, one more. We're running really low on time, like a minute. John 16, 30 says, the Philippian jailer, what must I do? And he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You and your household, you'll be saved. And then Acts 16 ends right there, right? Is that the end of the chapter? It's not the end. No, it's not the end. Verse 32 says, they spoke the word of the Lord to him. What do I do? Believe. Okay, what do I believe? I'm a Philippian jailer, probably a retired Roman soldier. Then they speak the word of the Lord, and what happens at midnight? Oh, he washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his strength. Repented away. and baptized. Immediately. Yeah. There's plenty of more objections. We're not going to have time. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 16 and 17 says, Christ sent me not to baptize. People mm -hmm. say, see? That says Christ sent me, that the word actually in Greek is Christ sent me not to be a baptizer. It didn't matter who baptized you. Yeah. And that, that wasn't was the his express purpose. No, no. So he was saying to preach the gospel. Exactly. Doesn't matter who baptizes you. Yep. Um, but we're not going to have more time to go into that. But if you want, we have a 30-page document on what the word means in Acts 2.38. I have a whole other 30-page document um, that I wrote for a class that I taught on the purpose of uh, baptism, all the New Testament passages. Once again, if you guys have any questions, even if you disagree, reach out to us. We'll talk to you. We'll talk to your pastor. And, um, okay, five-second thought. Five-second thought. All right. Go back to those two points I said. Is it in the Bible, number one? Number two, it's all about Jesus. It's not about some holy water. That's right. If you love Jesus, you'll obey him, right? That's right. All right, so Scott, five-second thought at the end. What do you think? Oh, I'd agree with Tucker. John 14, 15 and 15, 14, you got to do what God says. That's right. Thank you for joining us on The Authentic Christian. We'll see you back on the next episode. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the show today. We'd like to mention you can download these episodes. They are sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network. We have an app available. You can check that out on Apple or Android devices, and you can stream and listen in to the show and get answers to life's biggest questions.